son asks the father for his portion of the inheritance. The father gives what to him what belongs to him, and he goes off, the Bible says, and wastes his living in a riotous way. He wastes his living in a riotous way. And we pick it up in verse 14 of Luke chapter 15. When he had spent everything, a severe famine took place throughout that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him to his fields to feed the pigs. He would gladly have filled himself with the pods that the pigs were eating, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired hands have bread enough and to spare? But here I am, dying of hunger. I'm sure the young man had big plans. I'm positive. I'm sure he thought to himself, you know what, if I just take this money that belongs to me and my inheritance, I'm going to go off, I'm going to make my own way, I'm going to find myself, there's going to be a new me that's sort of independent from my family, I know I can do this. I'm sure he had big plans, but it didn't turn out that way, did it? It didn't turn out that way at all. In fact, he found himself living in a very disconnected way from what he was accustomed to living. But the key verse, really, a turning point, is there in verse 17. Do you notice that little phrase that we sometimes miss in the story? When he came to himself. When he came to himself. There was a turning point. Several years ago, there was a pop singer named Charlene, and she had a pop song that was called I've Never Been to Me. And in the song she talked about being all kinds of different experiences, events, places. Been all of these places, but I've never been to me. That was so popular, it was actually re-recorded almost every decade since then by someone else. And I think the reason the song was re-recorded is because it sort of relates to every generation. There comes that time in which we realize, or we ask ourselves the question, Am I living an authentic life? Here's why it's so important. Because we live in today's culture in such a connected culture, yet so disconnected from one another. Right? It's all about connectivity, we say. Yet, relationally speaking, and at a spiritual level, we are very disconnected. And I observe that many people today live their entire lives disconnected from who they are intended to be. Disconnected from who they are intended to be. Friends, discovering who we really are and who God would have us be is the greatest discovery of life that anyone can have. And it can bring great freedom and joy and purpose. Will we come to ourselves and find the person that God intends for us to be. How can it happen? Well, we get clues here in the story. There are really three, three face-to-face encounters that we need to have to make this discovery. First of all, to discover who you really are intended to be, you have to come face-to-face with who you are not. You have to come face-to-face with who you are not. That's finally what happened to the prodigal son. He came to himself and realized, this is not me. This is not how things are intended to be. And that seems like a very simple recognition, but it's a very difficult one for people to make. Because why? Because we want to go through life in a non-authentic way, pretending. We remember pretending. I did it as a child. I, my children do it. We, we all, I, I can still remember all those years ago, plain pretend with my friends. Plain pretend. Now, the genres of pretend have changed. Mine was sort of more the Western theme. You know, I was little Joe Cartwright riding on the Ponderosa with my brother, with my, with my broomstick, right, as my horse. That was me. Or a little later on, I mean, I had perfected the opening scene to Gunsmoke. I could walk right out onto the streets of Dodge City 
James Arness as Matt Dillon. I go around the house. James Arness as Matt. I can still remember doing that. It was all about the, the pretend and, and, and it was fun. And, and I always noticed something. Did you notice this? Some of the kids in the neighborhood, are, they were better at pretending than others. You know, they're the ones, I kind of had to make up my own little Joe Cartwright outfit. They're the ones that had the full dress. They just didn't have a broomstick. They actually had the one that had the horse's head on it, you know. They had all the equipment that was needed for perfect pretend. Always some that could pretend a little better than others. That's just a part of childhood. But friends, here's the tragedy. The tragedy is that many people live their entire lives that way. Pretending. Aren't we taught in terms of meeting the expectations of others? In terms of sort of giving what society wants us to give? That we learn at an early age how to put up the front that we need to put up in order to accomplish what we want to accomplish. We live pretend lives sometimes even as adults. And there has to come a point when we realize who we are not intended to be. This point came for young David in 1 Samuel chapter 17. I'm sure you remember the story. Many of you, a Goliath the giant challenges the people of Israel. No one wants to face Goliath, so the little shepherd boy David comes forward and says, I'll go against him. So King Saul says, well, you know, if you're going to go, you're going to have to have some armor. Read the story. This is sometimes part of the story we forget. So he takes, Saul takes his armor, adult military armor, and puts it on the young shepherd boy. He says, there you go. And so you can imagine David standing there with all of this armor clanking around. And finally he says, you know, I cannot go this way. I can't wear your armor. It's not me. So he casts off the armor and he goes as the shepherd boy with the sling and the staff and the stones and defeats Goliath. In fact, I did that story. Uh, our Joyful Noise After School program, we have a chapel service for them every month. And one time I did that very thing. I asked for some kids to volunteer. They were eager I had my overcoat, I had my suit jacket, had a pair of my shoes. I said, come on up, I want you to wear these. And so you can imagine these little kids up here, second or third graders, with my overcoat on, or with my suit jacket. And I asked them, now, if you were going to go over to the playground and play, would you want to be wearing this? Oh gosh, no. Of course not. But I wanted to say to them, even as a young age, this is not who you are. You're not called to be me. Finally, we have to come face to face with who we are not. And sometimes, friends, that is a very difficult realization. Because we've been told, this is who you need to be. This is who you need to be. This is who you need to be. And we just sort of go along with that mold. And if we have to pretend in order to accomplish, if we have to pretend in order to succeed, if we have to pretend in order to be affirmed, then we pretend. Finally, there comes a point, friends, if you're interested in authentic living, if you're interested in authentic living at all, where like the prodigal, you come to yourself and you realize face to face who you are not. And secondly, if we are to discover who we are fully intended to be, we then have to come face to face with who we can be. It's not just a matter of not. Now I have to have something positive. What vision is there? What model is there for who I can be on behalf of God and the kingdom? The son knew his family heritage. He knew who he belonged to. He even mentioned, if you know, my father's, my father's hired hands. He knew his father. He may have been living that denial for a while, but he knew he, who he really was and who he was really intended to be. We finally have to come face to face. Uh, remember a story about Willie Mays. Some of you may not know Willie Mays, one of the greatest baseball players of all time. But when he first broke into the league, one of the things that he started doing, because Jackie Robinson was, was indeed the one who plowed the new ground for the African-American athlete, the first one in the major leagues, Willie Mays decided he would try to copy Jackie Robinson's swing. And as a result of that, some of the success he'd had early, he started to decline. He started to not hit as well. 
So finally, his batting coach said to him, what, what are you doing? He said, well, I, I, Jackie Robinson was so great. I want to swing like Jackie Robinson. And Mays says the batting coach finally looked at him and said, Willie, you've got to swing like Willie Mays. You can't swing like Jackie Robinson. Swing like Willie Mays. And so that's what he did. And he went on to become one of the greatest baseball players of all times. Finally, we have to be presented a vision of who we are intended to be. I can remember myself as a teenager growing up in Nicholas County. They had a big service one time when the whole county was invited. And they put it at this giant tent in a field. And they had these church services. And they invited a gentleman whom some of you would know. They invited a gentleman by the name of Basil Hensley to come and preach. I was just a young teen. And I can remember hearing Reverend Hensley preach. Wow! I wish I would like to preach like that. When I went into the ministry, I can remember saying to my home pastor, I remember how Basil Hensley preached. I mean, he could preach forever and I could sit there and listen to him. I really loved it. I want to preach like him. And I remember my home pastor, Pastor Pete, looked at me and said, That won't work. I'm like, what? That won't work. No. If you're going to preach, he said, you have to preach as you. You. And what you're going to find is, in God's kingdom, because He's the one who created you, that's more than enough. What a freeing word. What a freeing word. I don't have to fit into someone else's mold. There's this vision of who God wants me to be out of the identity that He has given to me. He wants to connect with my life. And so it is with you, brothers and sisters. We finally have to come to ourselves. Come to ourselves and realize who God needs for us to be, who God desires for us to be, who God purposes us to be in the world around us each and every day. That can be such a freeing discovery. But how can it happen? That means we come to the third face-to-face -face encounter. We come face-to-face -face with who we are not. We come face-to-face -face with a vision of who we can be. But finally, for that to actually happen, we have to come face-to-face -face with Jesus Christ. That's where the parable ultimately points us. We come face to face with Jesus Christ. He's the one. Why? Why is that important? Because He's the one who knows us. He understands your identity better than anyone else. Now I have to admit to you, in the beginning, that can be an aggravation. He knows me. He knows my deepest longings. He knows my deepest fears. He knows where I've missed the mark. I can remember being aggravated to death with the fact that my mom knew me so well. You know, I could say something or do something. I knew that. What? She could have probably written down predictions from time to time of my behavior in any given situation. I'm convinced she could have. She knew me that well. And when someone knows you that well, there's a side of that that just aggravates you to death. Right? You can't get away from it. Why, why do you know? And in the beginning, it may be like that with you or someone that you know. When it comes to their relationship with God or their relationship with Christ, it might just aggravate them to death to the point that they want to run away from it. And you know what? That happens. Because they realize He really knows. He created me. Well, I don't know if He created me or not. Well, whether you believe He created you or not, He did. And it's not going to change it. And so finally, you come to yourself, you say. And in doing that, you realize that a face-to-face -face encounter with Jesus Christ can set your life in the direction of authenticity and can bring a genuineness to what you're doing that you've never experienced anywhere before. The musician, musician Benny Goodman, I know you know that name. Benny Goodman. The king of swing at one time in the 30s, right? Great clarinet player. Benny Goodman grew up in Chicago. He was a son of Russian immigrants. They came to this country because of anti-Semitism, anti-Jewish sentiment in Russia at the time. So they fled to our country. They found a home in Chicago. 
His dad, they had 12 children in the family. His dad worked night and day for a tailor just to earn enough money to take care of his family. But one of the things they noticed about little Benny was his musical ability. And so he saved up enough money to actually make it possible at 10 years old for Benny Goodman to fall under the tutelage of Franz Schwab. And under that tutelage, he began to be the great clarinet player. And Benny Goodman, in looking back on that experience, says, talking about Franz Schwab, he said, when I met that man and heard his music, it set my life on a new course. That's what Goodman said. And the rest is history. He went on to become one of the greatest musicians of all time. Carnegie Hall, King of Swing, Front of Time Magazine. All because he met someone. And he said, when I met that person, it set my life on a new course. Friends, hear me. There was this guy in the New Testament. He was a tax collector. His name was Matthew. I'm sure he thought that was going to be his career for the rest of his life. He was constantly... But then along came someone. He met someone named Jesus, and it set his life on a new course. It changed everything. Here was this man, Simon Peter and some others, who probably thought they were going to be fishermen, go into the family business the rest of their lives do what their father was doing. But one day, they met someone, and when they heard his message and his music, it set their life on a new course. There was this man named Saul who was very religious and zealous and thought that he was doing the right thing by persecuting Christians. He just thought he was doing the right thing. But see, on his way to Damascus one day, this man named Saul met someone. And he came face to face with Jesus Christ and it set his life on a new course. Missionary journeys all across the known world. Wrote more of the New Testament than anyone in history. This is Paul. His life was set on a new course. An Anglican priest in England, well-intentioned, all about doing good works and helping the poor, but still he felt an emptiness inside, John Wesley did. But one day he met someone And he had a heartwarming experience and it set his life on a new course. Friends, this is the story of the good news of God unfolding when people realize who they are not and they see who they really are. They come face to face with Jesus Christ and their life is set on a new course. Here is joy. Here is purpose. Listen, for one moment, I'm I'm going to bring this to a close. More than anything else today in this century, people are longing for authentic living. They're tired of the fake. They're tired of the phony. They're tired of putting up a front. They're looking for a genuine way to have genuine joy. Friends, the discovery is here. We come to ourselves. And we realize that through a connected relationship with God in Jesus Christ, I can discover who I truly am intended to be. Friends, that discovery will set you free. That discovery will bring you more joy than you've ever dreamed or imagined. This Lenten season, come to yourself. Plant a seed that might point someone else in the direction of coming to that encounter that can lead them to authentic living. Let us pray. Lord God, like the prodigal, we have our own ideas. You created us so you know this already. We want to pursue our own way. You sort of allow us to do that. We explore, we experiment, we think. We move. But regardless of outward changes that we may make, inwardly, Sometimes we still feel disconnected. Come to us anew on this day, O God. Speak to us. Give us courage to simply take our lives and place our lives in your hands, trusting that you can shape and mold us 
into individuals and into a community of faith that you've intended for us to be. And here in the context of worship, brothers and sisters, you can make your own quiet prayer. Lord Jesus, come into my heart. Show me who I really am intended to be. Might be one prayer you would pray. Lord Jesus, come into my heart. Show me who I really am intended to be. Perhaps there's someone in your friendship circle, social arena, that seems to be living disconnected from who they really are. Will you take the time to offer a brief prayer for them this morning? Lord Jesus, be near to and show them the way to joyful living might be one prayer you would pray. Lord Jesus, be near to and show them the way to joyful living. Then let's take a moment and pray for our life together as a community of faith. That we would be authentic in offering witness to others. That we would be genuine in reaching out to those in need. The hungry, the poor, the distressed. Lord Jesus, help us to be an authentic church for your glory. Might be one prayer you would pray. Lord Jesus, help us to be an authentic church for your glory. Lord God, we pray in your mercy on this day that you would hear our